Good morning if you are joining us from the West Coast. Good afternoon if you are joining us from the East Coast. And good evening if you are joining us from Turkey, like actually all of uh, the panelists today, our moderator, our speaker, and our discussant are all joining us from Turkey. So my name is Baki, Baki Tezcan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis, and I convene the um, various uh, online meetings that uh, Ottoman Turkish Studies Association does. Uh, I will start the meeting by sharing a very, very short slideshow to introduce the meeting, basically. You all know why you are here. And in a minute, uh, our moderator will introduce our speaker and discuss them to you. Um, we are here for uh, listening to the winner of the Yavuz Cesar Article Prize in the History of Architecture and the Urban Environment, which was established last year and given for the first time. Um, and it, I, for that reason, I think it is important to um, remember uh, Yavuz Cesar for a minute. Yavuz Cesar was um, somebody whom many of the people who are involved in the history of architecture knew uh, intimately. Um, and maybe our uh, uh, moderator could say a few things about him as well. Some of uh, his friends got together after losing him to uh, COVID. He was one of the um, first people uh, actually the, in, in the early stages of COVID um, whom we lost. Uh, so some of his friends got together and engaged in several ways of remembering him. And th this prize is not the only uh, thing that they did. There is also something that they established at Pozitu University. Yavu yeah, Cesar himself uh, uh, was a scholar of uh, history of architecture and you see his image right here. Uh, and I should um, thank to all of his friends who contributed to this award by bringing people together, engaging them. Uh, I will single out Aslihan Gürbüzel uh, just because she led the effort. Uh, she acted as a intermediary between uh, the group of his uh, friends and us, uh, raised the funds, uh, put the uh, funds together, and uh, we started giving the prize for the first time last year. Uh, and the prize will be given every other year. So there is no Yavu Cesar prize in 2023. There will be another one in 2024. For that reason, um, each time the prize is given, uh, the previous two years uh, will be eligible in terms of articles published in those two years. So the uh, jury, the selection committee of the first year, last year, uh, picked the winner and whom you will see uh, it, later today and also listen to his award-winning article. But please uh, remember Yavuz Cesar. And also, uh, I'm very grateful to everybody, as I said, um, in the person of Aslihan Gürbüzel, to all who uh, contributed funds uh, toward this award, and also um, in the uh, person of Chidem Kafescioğlu uh, for the selection committee, prize committee last year. Thank you all for making this possible. And then let me also tell you our, just a little bit about our upcoming WhatsApp meetings. In August, we will meet and uh, talk about the recently published issue of the Journal of the Ottoman Turkish Studies Association, um, it, which includes a special dossier on digital Ottoman studies. Uh, and then in September, we will uh, hear from Elif uh, Kevser Uzer Al Bayrak, the winner of Kekriotis Memorial Travel Grant uh, from last year. In October, uh, we will host Murat Metinsoy, the co-winner of the Otsa Book Prize from last year. In November, uh, we'll host the other co-winner of the Otsa Book Prize, Faisal Hussein. Now, I'd like to introduce you to uh, the uh, moderator of today, Semra Horus. She's a historian of architecture and urbanism, specializing in late Ottoman visual and material 
cultures. She received her MA in architectural history from the Middle East Technical University and obtained her PhD from Vienna University of Technology in 2021. During the fall of 2018, she was a visiting doctoral student in Walson College uh, at the University of Oxford. She previously worked as a teaching assistant in Bilgi University and as a lecturer in Bakhtashehir University, both in Istanbul. Between 22 and 23, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Agahan program for Islamic architecture at MIT. Uh, she will start her new position as a postdoctoral fellow in Rome, Bibliotheca Herziana, Max Planck Institute for Art History, in coming fall, fall 2023. Her main research interests are late Ottoman architectural and intellectual culture, urban history of Istanbul, Ottoman travel literature, and 19th century cultural mobilities and encounters. She has um, a few book chapters and articles published already. Uh, I'm not going to list them right now for the sake of time, and uh, we'll give the uh, microphone to uh, Semra for her to introduce um, our speaker and discussant today. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thanks also to everyone for joining us today uh, to our like commemoration, our late friend uh, Yavuz. I would like to also thank to Otsa and personally Baki Tezjan for allowing us and helping us to commemorate our friends through very fruitful events and initiatives, such as this article prize, the Yavuz Cesar Article Prize in the History of Ottoman Architecture and the Urban Environment. This is actually one of a series of events, and among them, I will just very briefly mention only two. The Yavuz Cesar Scholarship in Architecture and Urban History, awarded by the Boazic University, the Department of History. And secondly, the Yavuz Cesar's Memorial Talk Series are the annual lectures organized with the support of Koch University the Anamed Institution, and again, Boaz University Department, Department of History. So you can follow the upcoming events in uh, related web pages of these institutions and the uh, social, social platforms. So for me, it's always with a heavy heart uh, whenever I participate in or listen to any event commemorating Yavuz which was really an unmatching source of information about Istanbul and particularly the early modern Istanbul. So it is not different today, but I'm very pleased that this prize was awarded to Namuk Erkal, from whom I personally learned a lot during my master's degree, because I was like, uh, I had the chance to participate in his courses focusing on Istanbul. So I'm very glad that through these events, the scholarship will access more audience. And the structure of today's event is quite straightforward. Uh, I will introduce the speakers one at a time with a moment of break in between. And then I will also moderate the Q&A. And at that moment, if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand or type your question in the chat box so that I can read them aloud. Now I think I can proceed with the introduction uh, of Namuk Erkal. Namuk Erkal is the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture and Design in TED University. Trained as an architect and he graduated from the program of History of Architecture in Middle East Technical University with the thesis Constantinopolis, a study on the city of Constantinople as the artifice of Constantine the Great's imperial project, which was granted the Metu Mustafa Parlar thesis award. He obtained his PhD degree from the Department of Architecture from Metu with his dissertation on the analysis of Halic as an extramural zone as a frontier to Istanbul. In 2005, his postdoctorate research project was supported by Ilze and Georgi Hanfman Fellowship of American Research Institute in Turkey. And between 2002 and 16, Erkal taught in METU, and since 2016, he is a member of Tate University. 
He teaches both architectural design studios and architectural history courses, which in many ways I think is very inspirational and not very common, I would say, in connecting these two supposedly separate fields of the architectural practice and the theory, history, and criticism of architectural culture. He teaches courses on early modern urban morphology, the architecture of urban history of Istanbul, architecture and urban history of Istanbul, architecture of the everyday life in the early modern Mediterranean and Ottoman cities, and related to those, he has multiple publications focusing also on the economic and ceremonial structures of the city frontiers, marketplaces, custom houses, and the maritime ports as a part of his research interests. And currently, he is co-coordinating alongside Firuzan Melike Sumertas, I think she is also among us now, and Haris Theodorilis Vigas, the research project Fanariot Materialities, Aspects of Domestic, Residential, and Court Culture. And this project is supported by ANAMED, the Koch University Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations, which will yield, to say the least, a symposium in 2024 and an exhibition in 2025, and I'm sure many more. So I'm very curious about particularly this project and look forward to reading all the publications and visiting the exhibition. I think you can now share your screen now, Mukajan, and start your presenters. Um, thank you. Uh, and I will start by thanking the people who made the presentation possible. Uh, first, of course, I have to thank uh, OTSA for um, initiating uh, a prize, uh, the inaugural Yavuz Cesar Prize in History of Architecture and an Urban Environment. I am honored to receive the prize in the first cycle uh, with an article on urban history of Istanbul. Here, I think at least we meet with Yavuz Cesar, who uh, unfortunately I uh, haven't known personally. Uh, special thanks to uh, dear Sevil Engin Soy, who have nominated the article uh, for the prize. And um, I want to thank the prize selection committee for their appreciation and very generous prize justification note, and, uh, which was presented by dear Chidam Kafestrolu at the announcement ceremony. Uh, thank you, Bakio Jam, for the organization of this uh, lecture. We have been in continuous contact since the prize announcement. And uh, I'm, of course, grateful to dear uh, Sita Zandi Sayek for accepting to be a discussant during her summer leave. I'm privileged to have her, her as commentators in her, since her work on, on uh, architectural history and urban environment is groundbreaking and is exemplary for us all. And my thanks also goes uh, for Semra Horus for her attentive introduction. Near her research on late Ottoman material and visual cultures, uh, she devotes some of her time to commemorate active, commemorative activities for Yavuz Cesar. And of course, uh, the audience uh, here uh, uh, in the hottest days of the summer are highly <laughs> appreciated and uh, uh, the, by their presence, I should say. Okay. Uh, the architect article is part of my larger academic work on Ottoman Istanbul's harbor, Halic, the Golden Horn, as a special case of early modern maritime ports of the Ottoman Empire and the Mediterranean. As I have started to research on Halic architecturally and urbanistically, I have been amazed to see that there was much to do for representing it, representing it as a space, as a place. The location of specific functions, urban squares, and buildings are widely known and referred to. But what kind of buildings are we mentioning? What kind of a built environment? How these spaces compare with monumental architecture of the capital city? Are they compatible or of a different kind? 
I have worked on the architecture of custom houses, wholesale markets, uh, weighing and distribution centers, uh, kapans, uh, individually, and on a, on a larger scale, harbor zones, such as the Imperial Arsenal and some waterfront neighborhoods like Panar. Understanding the spatiality of the harbor and representing it on a comparative basis is one of my concerns. Uh, the article uh, that I'm, re I'm representing here starts by noting that pre-industrial public granaries, public st and state granaries were utilitarian buildings, but they were also instruments of food security regimes, representing a government's promise of abundance and plentitude against fear of famine and paucity. While the economic feasibility of the granaries depended on the availability and the circulation of reserves, it was also uh, predicated on architectural solutions uh, for handling the weight of grain and for preventing risks such as fermentation, rot, and pests. In the early modern period, uh, which includes the Little Ice Age, devastating famines occurred periodically and worldwide, and grain scarcity frequently brought state intervention uh, grain raids became widespread across Asia, Europe, and European colonies, ranging from territorial storehouse networks to monumental civic buildings. The article surveys in the intro introduction some of these significant civic uh, buildings, uh, specifically European city-states, uh, located their public granaries near central civic squares, maybe a manifestation of their self-dependency. And these were similar to uh, other public edifices, such as town halls. Uh, here in the slide, you see an example, which is Venice's Terranova Granaries, which was uh, directly located on the waterfront of San Marco Square. 18th century absolutism and imperialism brought near measures uh, to food security regimes, monumental uh, granaries substantial art aesthetically refined buildings. These were placed at the edge of the cities now because of their scale, but designed by celebrated architects and they were called palaces of grain, palaces of abundance. And uh, Palazzo dei Granili in Nap Naples, here you see in the image, designed by Ferdinando Fuga for the Bourbon Kings, maybe the largest of its kind with 560 meter long waterfront facade can be mentioned here. Ideas about public granaries moved from Europe to its colonies, sometimes multiplying the models, but sometimes where syncretic types related to local vernacular architectures emerged. Uh, here in the image, you see the, so the, uh, the Golhar, which was in Patbatsna, Bihar in India, and which was uh, designed by locals and Captain John uh, Gerstein. Contrary to these significant precedents, early modern granary architecture is an isolated topic and comparative studies are rare. Uh, my article presents the Ottoman capital city Istanbul state granaries as part of the emerging topic of urban states infrastructures in early modernity. Istanbul, uh, one of the world's largest cities in this era, consumed vast quantities of grain, as you know, uh, wheat, barley, millet, and rye. Rice is out of my uh, <laughs> uh, research, I should say. It is another topic. Although grain provisioning in Istanbul has been much discussed, specifically by economic historians, literature on the architecture of the city's granaries is scarce. The article had both formed the material and tried to interpret that material in comparison to the other local and international examples. During the 15th to 18th centuries, we cannot specifically mention a single architectural typology for Ottoman state granaries. In provincial cities like Rodostruk, Selanik, grain was stored in marked buildings with or without courtyards or in cells set on commercial streets near the port. The best known regional granaries were in the Levant and Egypt, 
uh, where climatic conditions were quite different and which were based on pre-Ottoman precedents and local architectural traditions, such as Damascus's Baika grain storehouses and Cairo's granaries of Joseph, both built to sustain pilgrims on the Hajj. By the 18th century, the Ottoman state began to standardize the architecture of its granaries. In Istanbul and the provinces on the Western Black Sea and the Danube, major, um, major, uh, the state sought to improve its grain provisioning system and expand its granary facilities. By the centuries and the first purpose-built state granaries were constructed. Yet no complete early modern state granaries still stand in present day Istanbul, and more are fully more uh, none are fully represented in known historical sources. So uh, what the article re uh, does is to re uh, reconstruct the city's state granaries to an examination of surviving architectural evidence and textual and visual sources found in various archives. Restitution drawings based on this evidence supports the analytic descriptions whenever possible, also their storage capacities are acknowledged. Unsurprisingly, uh, saying the storage capacity, a key focus for all the granaries uh, is the storage type. His historically, there are several types of grain storage, most common of which are loose bulk, uh, storage in cloth, uh, cloth sacks, or, and storage in bins, uh, which may be clay, stone, or wood. Storage types played a greater role in determining a building's capacity of storage than did the building's total volume. So building, in that sense, uh, we are lucky building construction and restoration registers in the uh, state archives provide ample information about granary interiors and storage systems after the 18th century. Istanbul's early modern uh, state granaries developed through three stages that coincided with changes in the governance of public grain provisioning systems. The first stage involves the imperial trusts, Miri Emanet, and their uh, storehouses from the mid 15th to late 17th uh, centuries. In this period, the grain provisioning was based on, based on subsistence, committed supply and redistribution, and the government itself did not store most of this grain, but rather distributed it from the Unkapana, official grain weighing and distribution center, to the city's bakers and millers for storage and use. I will not get into the architectural details of the Unkapana magazine here, uh, but want to underline that. This building resembling an enclo enclosed hunt or caravansary with its pitched roof was not a granary per se, but an enclosed holding zone and market hall where customs and distribution activities occur. It was around and across Bahçekapı at the entrance of the Golden Horn and at the foot of the Topkap Palace that the actual state granaries were situated for this period. Here was the wheat trust, uh, um, barley storehouse trust, and the sellers trust. Uh, the three Bahçekapı uh, granaries were variations on basic Mediterranean storehouse models, going back to antiquity maybe, and running through the Byzantine era. Long rectangular buildings, they had thick walls with small clear story windows and hipped roofs with ventilation shafts or openings. Neither of these granaries, in fact, displayed obvious indicators of royal ownership, either in adoration or architectural style. Like the Unkapana magazine, they were quotidian buildings and any state power they conveyed came solely from their location at the Veziriskelis, a very significant location, and uh, which was uh, the landing stage for uh, the envoys visiting the Topka Palace and from their relatively large scale. In mid 16th century, Wheat Trust acquired a new building at the Galata waterfront across Bahçekapı. 
which would be the greatest granary of the city before the 18th century. A conversion of the former Byzantine fort of Galata, Castello. This was originally a rectangular bastion with an undercroft. Like the Uncapana magazine and the Sellers Trust, the imperial magazine was converted from fort to granary by architect Sina. The work involved enclosing the bastion with a high lead covered hip roof. Thus the granary came to be known as the leaded magazine. Resting on a crenellated parapet left over the old fort, pang and punctuated by several small windows, this tip roof was one of the largest of its kind in Istanbul. The granary functioned uh, until 1676, when it became a storehouse for the new Galata or custom house. In 1752, as you know, the undercroft uh, became, um, was turned into a mosque, Yer Altı Cami. The undercroft provided a good insulation against dampness, probably, and a strong foundation to send toward ample loads from the seven meter high storage space above. The granary interior probably had several stories um, with wooden floors and storage spaces on multiple levels, but these are all hypothetical, I should say. Depending on how the grain was stored as bulk, or in wooden bins, its capacity would have ranged. The leaded magazine was a kind of, a, although a transformed building, a fortified granary, a bus bastion like building that, power, that powerfully represented the state's public provisioning activities. And in that sense, it was not different from fortified granaries that we find in Europe in the same uh, period, such as the uh, Terra Nova granaries in Venice. Uh, I don't get into the details, but you, here, you, but in the text, you can see the, uh, some details about this comparison, uh, the, the, um, the granaries of Venice and Istanbul in the 17th century. Uh, the second stage of state granaries in early modern Istanbul is the 18th century and is on the emergence of a different makeshift granary type. She said, turned granaries. Early 1700s in Istanbul is a time where commodity acquisition by the state expanded into civilian provisioning. Under the new geopolitical realities of an empire in conflict and competing for resources and territory against the Habsburgs and the Russians, the state monopolized grain production in the Danubian principalities, aiming to make the region uh, a kind of a breadbasket of the capital city. It also regularized and increased direct purchases of grain by appointing merchants and provided emergency civilian supplies to the capital city. The imperial arsenal, naval arsenal, was given charge of the city's reserves and tasked with building new state granaries. Official purchases were stored at, at this arsenal as emergency civilian supplies, which were then released to Unkapunu just across the harbor uh, with the Imperial Council's permission. As official purchases increased, the arsenal's granaries expanded. The easternmost section of the shipyard, at this period, the shipyard was under transformation. It was into a transformation from a galley harbor to a galleon uh, shipyard. So some of the shipyards were obsolete and the, the ones in the old arsenal at the edge of Galata, in, uh, between Galata and Kasım Pasha were transformed uh, um, in this process. And the old shipsheds became new storehouses. Since antiquity in this region, shipsheds, uh, which were called in Ottoman as göz or çeş, had typically in long narrow enclosures with masonry walls on the longer side, uh, with slipways covered by gable roofs, occasionally walls. These were built in rows usually, and sometimes in a parallelogram shape uh, for, the, for in, uh, enclosing a larger um, object within. Uh, turning a shipshed into a granary, which developed through the century, meant the walling of the front and the back facades and building wooden storage bins inside, called sanduk or ambar uh, in another scale. 
placed on raised foundations and covered on top by waxed clothes. Uh, you'll see the restitutions of Sıtkı Bey storehouses in the image, uh, which I tried to uh, reconstruct in reference to some uh, archival uh, um, descriptions. In a survey conducted in 1793, the capacity of arsenal granaries were given uh, as 28 units, 28 goes in several groups. And it was noted as 1 million kile, 25,000 pounds. An engraving uh, from by the traveler, the Aristizabal, uh, the, the Aristizabal shows the arsenal at that time. The frigates floating nearby invoke the connection between the grain ships and the ship sheds turned granaries, which were in effect land bounded grain ships, <laughs> the granaries themselves, with stocks transferred from one container to another from uh, the ships to the granary uh, bins. The third stage of the state granaries is that of the grain inspectorate. During the reign of Selim III, commonly known as the New Orders, grain provisioning for the capital city was restructured to increase efficiency, decrease losses, and create cash reserves sufficient to fund the state's uh, restructuring programs, um, which resulted in significant increases in grain purchasing by the state, accounting for as much as one third to half of grains consumed in the capital city. It was aimed to double the emergency civilian stores and new granaries were built near existing ones between 1793 and 1802. However, strangely, since some of the existing granaries were taken out of use at the same time, the increase was relatively less than planned. In the uh, arsenal uh, of the 28 ship sheds turned granaries in 1793, 10 was left at early 1800s, uh, which was related with the construction of dry docks in the arsenal at the same location. And uh, some of the former granaries were demolished. Uh, one granary that's left from this period um, is Tashambar, as you see in this image. And this is one of the few buildings preserving its architectural boundaries as a, a granary space in the present day Istanbul without specific um, uh, additions to its storage um, capacity. The urgency with which the new grain inspectorate worked to increase emergency supplies is illustrated in the conversion of two adjacent ancient buildings, a bathhouse and a caravansary, into granaries. In the first of this, these, um, Chukur Hamam was unique in being the only state-run storehouse in the city, not situated on the water. Originally built in the second half of the 15th century, this large former bedhouse stood on a north facing slope near the Fatih religious complex. The article mentions the original plans of its conversion with elevated floors and double stacked wooden bins, interestingly replacing the, um, uh, the Jamekan uh, within, the, uh, within the cold room of the uh, bath. And uh, so a, a kind of a wooden structure uh, in analogy. And um, the early version of the project was never realized. And because of economic considerations, instead the granary operated as a dilapidated makeshift affair whose design deficiencies led to the widespread uh, spread damage of its stock. The Grain Inspectorate's second conversion project involved a caravansary near the Üsküdar landing on the Asian side, originally called the Kurşunlu Han or the Leded Han. This was realized by Sinan in the 1540s with the Mühürmah religious complex. Following its designation as a Geller granary, the Imperial Storehouse operated for four and a half years without significant modification until its remodeling in 1797. Uh, what was done, what, like in the other uh, project, was fitting wooden bins into the existing structure. 
which we have with little further architecture modification. This did not always work in this old buildings. Many converted granaries resorted to storing lower quality, but durable, which means rot resistant grains, such as kokoros, kokoros uh, which is Indian corn. And the final uh, stage of the, um, uh, the granaries uh, it, uh, um, that I mentioned, the most important maybe, is uh, the main architectural achievement of the grain inspectorate was the construction of new purpose-built uh, built granaries between 1797 and 1802 at Öküz Limanı or Paşa uh, 7, 700 meters north of the Üsküdar landing. The new granaries stood on the Asian side. Historians have interpreted this view as motivated by the grains inspectorate's desire to provision the city from the Anal Anatolian provinces when needed as Black Sea is threatened. There are other possible causes like the construction of Sikimia barracks or the uh, emerging importance of the, uh, the Dolma, uh, um, Beşiktaş Palace, and uh, so that there may be other reasons. In any case, locating the new granaries there removed half of the city's emergency reserves from Unkapana across Unkapana and the Golden Horn. Perhaps the government sought to distance the new state granaries from old institutions and practices, including uh, demanding views and corrupt uh, storekeepers. The construction of the granaries in two stages with the collaboration of head architects, Mehmet Arifa, Todori Kalfa, and an engineer from Arsenal, who is probably Francois Kalfer, is well known. The 1797 report identifies two architectural precedents for the new granaries in Ökuzlumanı, the existing granaries at the Imperial Naval Arsenal and the granaries at Ruscuk. The reference to the so-called three-storied granaries at Rustruk points to the uh, use in Öküzlümanı of the stacked bin granary type uh, with separate levels for circulation and ventilation. Such a design also enabled the separation of grains according to type, storage, duration, quality, and other factors. The article de de debates uh, in detail and questions the contribution of Kaufer, who was attributed to be one of the uh, designers of the um, granary to the project and um, his, um, his contribution and how much um, can that be in comparison to the ones in Europe, uh, but I'm <laughs> leaving it for the reader. And all that remain today from the Episcop Limana granary's original architecture are these outer envelopes. However, a building survey of 1802 produced after the new storehouse's completion provides evidence of the granary's former interior arrangements. And this is of course a topic of, about early modernity. This registers is very perfectly um, noted. You can really re make a restitution out of uh, the register in the list of activities one by uh, one. The building had three bays, each with its own door access from the small entrance hallway. The interiors were almost totally filled with wooden bins, uh, each with uh, and a half meters, six and uh, 85 meters and 4.87 meters in height, stacked one over another and standing on foundations on short brick pillars. The bins were placed on either side of narrow central aisles, uh, one and a half meters wide, above which were wooden walkways on two other levels and um, reaching reached by winding staircases. This stacked bin system was designed with the idea that grain reserves uh, would first put on the top, uh, uh, bin and then would circulate to the other ones when it's, uh, the other is empty by wooden pipes called kubur and made of wooden beams, columns and nail braces, the units were lined with wood seamlessly. 
There were 20, uh, 12 double stacked bins on each bay and 72 bins per building. The Öküz uh, uh, Limanı Granaries represents the integration of innovative and traditional features. The proportions of each storehouse unit, the width of the bays, the length of the compartments, as well as their placement in rows are similar to what we find at the Arsenal Granaries, which were in fact transformed buildings. The raised foundations and the division of compartments into smaller bins uh, where grain um, and where, uh, where grain was separated according to type, place of origin, quality, and storage duration are also shared. The earlier shipshed turned granaries thus initiated arrangements that became standard in the later purpose-built granaries, such as those at as Ökuzdiman. But Ökuzdiman's design featuring double stacked bins accessed by walkways on three levels was a novelty, one that doubled storage space within the same footprint. Uh, the waterfront facade of the building with its rational fenestrations and marble portals is an example of new order state building uh, reflecting is similar institutional uh, features uh, to some examples uh, in the West. Uh, this article has underlined the importance of understanding grain storage systems and their impacts on state greenery architecture and the resources it represented. Istanbul's granaries of the 18th and 19th centuries were often relatively small in scale compared to, for example, Palazzo dei Granili here you see at the top, um, and formally unassuming, yet they were built around highly compact and condensed systems of grain bins. Their exterior, exterior scale and form, possibly suggestive of low production and limited resources, concealed their efficiency and capacity and contained wealth. Uh, this was a major difference between the early modern European um, granaries, where the architectural splendor of which frequently wailed less condensed storage systems, a low line bulk system. Istanbul's granaries demonstrate why attention to unpretentious architecture and all but visible infrastructure is so important. The reserved architecture of these granaries indicated neither incompetence but rather adaptation and inefficiency, uh, about efficiency and the promise of abundance. And so that's why the title of the uh, article is Reserved Abundance. Reserved is obvious, but reserved also in the sense of being this guy's not apparently visible and uh, so on. So thank you. This was very long, maybe. I'm sorry. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. Um, Thanks so much for this sweeping kind of history of the granary starting from the mid 15th until the beginning of 19th century. And now I will proceed with the introduction of our discussant today, Sibel Zandi Sayek. Sibel Zandi Sayek is an associate professor of art history at the College of William and Mary. She was the co she was the founding uh, co director of William and Mary's Asian and Middle Eastern Studies program and has previously taught at Brown University. She holds professional degrees in architecture and city planning from the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD in architectural history from the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Zandi Sayek teaches courses on the connected histories of the built environment with a focus on the 19th and 20th centuries of Europe, the US, the Mediterranean and the Middle East, as well as more specialized seminars on the politics of public space, built heritage and commemoration. Sandy Sayek has published on the spatial and material dimensions of urban life in late Ottoman ports, which have appeared in English, French, and Turkish. She is the recipient of several research awards, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, and the Aga Khan Program for Islamic Architecture and the Fulbright. Her Ottoman book, I'm sure many of us um, here 
is very knowledgeable about the Ottoman Izmir, the rise of a cosmopolitan port, 1840 to 1880, which came out from University of Minnesota Press in 2012, won the 2013 Fuad Köprülü Prize in Ottoman and Turkish studies. And I must say personally, I am one of the <laughs> uh, avid readers of this book more than once. And I'm not alone, I think, in resist, trying to resist myself not to dream about such kind of a book in every 19th century city. So it's personally also really important for me. And she has served on the Ottoman and Turkish uh, Association board between 2013 and 15, where she chaired the OTSA Article Prize and the OTSA Graduate Student Prize in 2014 and 15, respectively. So currently, she's working on two projects that investigate knowledge networks between the 19th century Ottoman and Anglo-American worlds, one through an early Ottoman factories and mobile industrial brokers, and another through an American missionary college in Izmir. So Sibel John, you can start your paper. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, Sebra, for this very generous uh, introduction. And thank you, Baki, for hosting and coordinating this event, and also for your tireless leadership of OTSA over the years. Uh, thanks are especially in order, I think, to the friends and colleagues of the late Yavuz Cesar, who made this very award uh, possible in the first place. It's an extremely fitting tribute to his memory and the quality of his work. Uh, although I never had the opportunity to meet uh, Yavuz in person, I've known of him as a bright and promising architectural historian of his generation. Uh, all this uh, to say that I am very pleased to be part of this inaugural award and to have the opportunity to both um, highlight some aspects of Namuk's award-winning article and to remember at the same time and celebrate Yavu Cesar's work. And thank you, of course, to all of you for being here in the midst of the summer uh, at the height of the heat here uh, in Turkey, where I'm tuning in from. Now, um, thank you, Namik. Thank you very much for this highly informative and richly illustrated presentation. I had read your article, but listening to your presentation was enlightening, further enlightening. You raised uh, a set of important uh, points that I believe would lead to a very engaging conversation. Uh, now, as your presentation made evident, and I don't want to kind of repeat things, your article is extremely rich and remarkably well synthesized. Uh, not only does it um, enrich the scholarship on the urban history of early modern Istanbul and also contribute, I would say, to the rather um, scant uh, literature on Ottoman granaries and utilitarian architecture, which is a somewhat overlooked topic um, in the field, but um, I value the fact that it also brings an Ottoman perspective to granaries, to granaries in the early modern world by framing precisely early modern Istanbul into a global context through pertinent comparisons um, ranging from Venice to India that you've briefly introduced uh, also at the beginning. And importantly, um, I think your very approach shows how spatial reasoning can be very fruitfully brought into historical studies. And I think this is a very important um, contribution of, of this article. And uh, the very fact that Reserved Abundance uh, was published in the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, which um, for those of you who might not be familiar with the field, this is the flagship journal um, in our field, and it features uh, scholarship from across regional specializations. And um, this, um, its publication there speaks in itself of the meticulousness 
of your research namak and, and your creative approach. Now, I have many wonderful things to say about this article, perhaps too many to fit in the allotted time. So I'm going to try to keep my comments brief and then um, try to ask a couple of questions to get us started with the conversation. Uh, this way we will have ample time for questions or comments uh, from the audience. Now, let me start by saying that uh, many aspects of your article resonate with uh, what I understand to be Yavuza's intellectual concerns. Uh, first and foremost, uh, your research sits at the intersection of the design and production of architecture on the one hand, and the economic and social context of the city on the other. And you aptly weave this particular type of architecture, this kind of modest utilitarian architecture, uh, its materiality, its location, its internal organization to broader questions about the urban economy, about food security regimes and the regulatory aspects of the imperial bureaucracy. These are the kinds of concerns I know have also kind of driven um, the, the scholarship or of Yavu, so it's particularly appropriate and fitting uh, to see to see your work recognized in that way. Now, one of the valuable aspects of the article um, is how, through the very prism of granary architecture, you found an effective way of getting to the mindset uh, of the time, kind of to this pragmatic mindset of efficiency and adaptation. And I hope that we can get to discuss this a little bit. We can unpack this a little bit more in the questions um, and the discussion. Uh, you, do, you do this uh, through a very careful attention to the interior organization of these granaries. Uh, for example, rather than interpreting these structures visually, externally, as mere urban artifact, you look at how they actually function inside. And I, I find this to be especially um, uh, not challenging, but also um, very rewarding. And as you mentioned yourself, the, the title of your article, Reserved Abundance, is very apt and clever in this regard. It evokes uh, the visual qualities of these structures, the kind of humble, modest, demure, uh, kind of qualities as opposed to being opulent, striking, or ostentatious. But at the same time, it also points to the functional programmatic aspects of the structures, reserves, right? Storage of abundance. So I, I think that's kind of nicely captured, um, captured there. And this is um, a challenging type of architecture to study um, in such a granular way, in part because not many structures have survived, but also um, it requires laborious effort to bring them to life, to correlate fragments of spatial information that you have gleaned um, carefully from cartographic and visual representations uh, with, um, and correlating them with, with disparate um, registers and textual sources. Uh, so the work behind that is, is, is com very, very commendable and th something that you do admirably well, right? Mining maps, plans, registers, secondary sources, and even producing your own drawings that you've, you've shown us and your own visualization based on this um, historical evidence and your interpretation of this historical evidence. So as I said, I have lots of praises, but I think I should probably try to switch gears and um, begin asking some, some questions. I have some questions and I was formulating some as I was listening to, uh, some broader and some more specific. And I'm thinking perhaps I will raise a few um, and then turn it over to you. Uh, and perhaps after that, we could open it to everyone's questions or I have more questions uh, and follow-ups if, uh, uh, if you'd like to, to return that. So. I want to start with a um, broad and more conceptual question that relates to the writing of spatial uh, of a spatial history, as some have called it. 
Um, and then I have a question, therefore, about the way in which you chose to structure and construct your narrative. Uh, as you have also shown us in your presentation, you follow three stages in the control and administration of public grain provisioning system in Istanbul. Um, you start with the Miri Emanet Liri, the Imperial Trusts um, that, that controlled this kind of provisioning in the 16th, 17th century. You move to the takeover by the Tarsani Amiri, the naval arsenal, and then you eventually end with the um, uh, Zahir and Azarit, the, uh, the Inspectorate of Grains in the 19th century. Now, I can perfectly see the merits of this kind of an organization of your narrative and the coherence it allows, but um, this is also a periodization, I would say, that privileges administrative change of hand and uses this kind of institutional change as the milestones to narrate architectural development. And I wonder if you could elaborate on um, how you understand, in fact, this interplay between institutional change on the one hand, in terms of the control administration of grain provisioning and uh, the institutions of control, as I, as I said, and the, the very architecture and the spatial changes that are, that are taking place. How do you talk about this um, kind of interplay and whether this linear chronology does justice or this kind of periodization does justice to the spatial evidence or whether there might be other periodizations that emerge from a closer analysis of that spatial evidence. In fact, I'm kind of partly inspired by the final section of your paper in asking this question. Uh, the final um, section that talks about the efficient storage system developed in the later Kuzleman granary, which uses another logic, right? It delves into the building. It foregrounds the spatial evidence. And it's a wonderful way um, in which the paper, in, in fact, culminates. But I'm wondering if that thinking could have permeated uh, the overall narrative. Um, and here, uh, just, just to open up a little bit this question, I know it's kind of perhaps a little vague and, and broad, but I'm thinking of um, writers like Paul Carter in his Road to Botany Bay, who distinguished between or who distinguished between the writing of an imperial history and the writing of a spatial history. Like imperial history writing that he sees as a practice relying on some kind of a priori taken for granted categorizations of periodizations, as opposed to a spatial history that starts with the interaction between people and their environments, right? So I would love to hear more about how you kind of conceptualize the writing of a spatial history. And if you have any thoughts on that, um, that's kind of a broad question, but it would be very informative to kind of unpack a little bit um, this creative approach that you have, and especially the, 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 your final conclusions about the Akuz Limana uh, granary. Um, a, I'll ask another, maybe another question or two, and then you could decide which ones you would like to, to, to take on and, and comment or care to comment about. Uh, a second uh, question I had um, is, um, has to do with this kind of particular framing you establish at the outset uh, that I really appreciate. Uh, thinking of the granaries as a contested field between different actors and interests, be it state and private, um, military or humanitarian priorities or fiscal charitable ones, right? It's, it's, it very nicely captures the complexities, the entanglements of any food security regime. And I wonder if you could elaborate some more on this notion of a contested field through the evidence that you came across. Uh, in your article, for instance, you mentioned uh, briefly the conflict between officials and merchants over a law requiring them to hold grain reserves for six months at any given time, uh, which I think hints at a particular reliance on private parties on the part of the state. Um, 
Are there other kinds of issues or tensions related to the very practice of storing and distributing? Um, instances that might make um, the Ottoman case may perhaps similar or distinct to other contexts um, that are also kind of dealing with this kind of, you know, with, with, with this kind of regime. I, I know you had mentioned colonial examples, especially the ones in Mexico and other places. And I'm wondering if there is, um, there are particular forms of, of, of issues or tensions that 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 emerge in this kind of uh, uh, in this kind of or or if you could kind of elaborate on this contested field as it emerges in the Ottoman um, um, environment. And uh, one last kind of more open and perhaps slightly more specific questions. Um, I'm very curious to hear about um, what you know regarding the infrastructure of grain distribution throughout the city. How did, for example, provisioning the mills and the bakers actually work through what kinds of human and physical networks and how these networks shaped urbanity? Um, a corollary question to this is, um, what do we know about the builders? of these granaries. You mentioned the Greek kalfas uh, in your presentation. Um, um, what are the types of people who are brought together in the process of provisioning? The Liman, for instance, is, is kind of the quintessential space of kind of, you know, different people coming into contact and whatnot. And, and if we could get even a, a better sense of how these granaries functioned uh, in that way, what kind of people did they bring uh, together. I'm also curious about the perception of these structures among city dwellers. Um, I think in your uh, article, you refer to Sheikh Ghalib's comment on the Ukuzliman granaries. Um, did granaries, for example, enter the discourse of administrative or intellectual elite? Did they garner praises like fountains and other forms of infrastructure? Um, and uh, so these are some um, some kind of um, uh, follow up questions that I was I was I was curious to hearing um, more about, and that your 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 piece somewhat uh, made me think. Uh, I will stop here, uh, I think, without loading it uh, more, and turn it over to you. And again, before I do that, thank you, Namuk, for truly a groundbreaking article. This is going to be an important piece of reference, I know, for anyone who will be working on um, this particular topic of, of, of grains and, um, and, and, the, and the harbor of Istanbul. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, and let me turn it over either to you or to Semra to kind of uh, moderate. Okay. Um, um, thank you, Sibel, for uh, this. Um, um, first of all, um, the, the, the praises and about the article, and also a very, very uh, important comments that uh, open in my mind new perspectives, but also uh, that will help me to explain myself uh, maybe um, better in this way. And I may start with the first question, which is very good and which has, in fact, understood the, um, the nature of the things, which um, I, um, I, I understood in the research, the granaries from the Kuzliman back, I should say. So it, uh, first, it, I understood the wooden bin system within the, that building. And then I could understand in the early 18th century documents what was meant uh, with, the, uh, with the simpler, but again, bin system within the, uh, within the arsenal. And I'm, I'm questioning the existings of the bins in an earlier period. Uh, for example, in the barley storehouse, there were wooden bins, but I know this from the early 19th century documents, which can also be another conversion. So I, um, I don't know that exactly um, from an earlier period, but 
maybe a checking and, or understanding can be uh, the amount of grain stored uh, for in the other sources without talking about the buildings. So in that sense, yes, the, uh, the, the text follows the institutional um, changes. And that's also because uh, how the grain provisioning is written by economic historians uh, in the first place. So uh, I have to rely, of course, on, um, on a very um, developed, uh, um, you know, um, bibliography on grain provisioning of Istanbul, um, which starts by uh, Lutfi Gücer and then still going on today. And there, um, this type of an institutionalization was uh, first uh, put and then what I surveyed through the building seemed to support that point of changes that um, like the uh, of course the transformation of the imperial arsenal for example is a force probably during the time of Chol Ali Pasha and uh, so um, that also fun became a reason for um, the placement of this new reserves there. Uh, so yes, this is, but the, um, I think it could have been outside of the periodical analysis, but as I said, I tried to show that in the earlier periods, there was almost uh, no concern for uh, storage. Mostly they were distributed from the, um, the weighing and distribution center. It was the <clears throat> duty of the bakers and millers to keep reserves and which was uh, very practical for the state. And the Ottoman state is the, not the only state uh, which does this um, in uh, Europe. In fact, uh, to, to a period with the exception of city states, some states uh, refrained from building granaries. Granary is all can, by itself be a reason of famine. You know, you can destroy a, a year's am amount of grain with bad architecture, you know? Uh, so with bad uh, rotting and uh, fermentation and so on. So they had the expertise and they tried to make it less as much as possible uh, for, uh, and try to found other ways of dealing with the things. So that's, probably why in the earlier period, we don't see that much of a uh, rainy uh, existence, but then it becomes a concern. And that also in a way uh, answers, uh, is a difference between the European absolutist examples, which were not exactly based probably on an urgent need but in the Ottoman case, at some periods, these were urgent needs that should be taken within the city. And so, for example, it was hurried uh, to find some kind of a place for adaptation and uh, so on. In the other case, they built a palace for the uh, grain with, uh, with the ideas of an en enlightened ruler who controls you know, the needs for the public and uh, things like that. Um, the abundance was a, probably a kind of a very important thing also for the Ottoman state. To con it was life and death <laughs> for the uh, administrations, but uh, we don't see it represented architecturally. There were other solutions found. So, but it turns the other way around. We see it architecturally more and architecture at the end becomes a kind of a uh, solution for uh, in a time of crisis, if I understood um, uh, the, your question. So the, um, the networks that distributes the uh, grain within the city are, and another problem is of course, that some of the buildings that I mentioned are uh, very much continuous. Um, they, there are some buildings that change, but Unkapana, for example, is doesn't change for 400 years. It is within the same location, within the same architectural uh, features for a very long time. 
and it is also you know the Üsküdar landing stage is also uh, like that. So and also the Arpa, uh, the Veziris Kilisi, Arpa Emaneti Barley uh, Warehouse. So these places were also um, you know uh, continuing in different periods their existence while things other things changed. Uh, so that was one of um, the reasons as they were coming from an earlier period, I started also with their, um, with their beginnings. And then the, um, the relations between, um, I had studied elsewhere, how Unkapana works architecturally and as a landing square uh, in detail. So he, there, of course, it's a place, a uh, contested place, for all the relationships about the grain and grain price uh, decisions and all the distributions. And, um, but um, at least at that stage, it's not about uh, the storage. It is, you know, because um, this kind of storage of the grain and keeping the granary is itself a kind of a power. And uh, the grain keeper, the register keeper has that power. And uh, so there is always a kind of a, uh, possibility of speculation in that. Sometimes there are arsons, they burn the storehouses. And so they actively change the, uh, spec the economic uh, flow of goods within the city. This changed after the big emergence of the, um, the, the granaries in the arson also. And that's why I speculated of the move of the uh, grain, main granaries to the Akuzlimana uh, area, far from the city, away from the market, uh, so in a more controllable area. When it was in the Arsenal, although the Arsenal is an enclosed area, there seems to, it's very close to Unkapana practically, uh, but there seems to be too much interaction between um, the two. The same for um, the uh, other earlier uh, granaries. So um, the, they are um, contested uh, spaces in bringing together all different factors of the society, like army, like the, this is, um, this is coming partially from the theorization of Dominique Collet, as uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, this contested uh, place and the food security regimes. And uh, they are, um, uh, these uh, are um, changing from, for example, the religious foundations, their kitchens, and uh, the army, and the um, other. I don't uh, have a deep knowledge, I should say, and I didn't go into that uh, deeply on this. Uh, what ha what happens? Um, usually, I should say, it, the the grain is not directly distributed from the. Uh, granary. It comes again to the Unkapana. So the old system also continues uh, in the way that the millers and bakers still keep reserves, uh, but the state controls the uh, keeping of the reserves and how they're distributed in the city. So there's, um, but sometimes when there is a plentitude of uh, storage, when they would drought, they force, for example, the uh, the bakers and millers to buy grain from the storehouse. So this storehouses uh, action is really very uh, sometimes complicated and brings out very, uh, very interesting uh, social interaction examples, I should say, throughout the city. Uh, I try to, um, the difficulty is really the, the text uh, start to, restitute the buildings they don't exist so that needs a lot of description and try to um, and try to uh, somehow connect out those descriptions with the actual living city <laughs> uh, I, I would like to have more space to uh, do that really because it's also very condensed text but yeah that sometimes I try to do like the uh, example of Ahmed Lutfi Efendi that you mentioned about his comments about the uh, grains that come from Chukurhamam uh, 
at the crisis of 1829. Uh, so he uh, says that, um, for example, stinking rotten chunks of hardened millet, rye, and Indian core, corn. So the, 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 the condition is such bad that they had to use the reserves in the Chukur Hamam. So uh, the, uh, when, the, so there is good granaries, the, there is granaries that kept grain good and there were derelict granaries. When you go to the reserves within the <laughs> derelict ones, then the conditions are really serious. So, but still there is something to eat. Uh, that's what it seems from uh, what is ex explained within the economic histories and also what comes out from my research. For example, I was very interested, um, puzzled to see no impact of the 18th cen uh, 17th century, uh, you know, crisis in Anatolia, climate crisis, nothing like that seen architecturally to affect uh, Istanbul. But when you look from that perspective, it is like that. Of course, there may be other uh, determinants to show this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Thank you for your comments and questions. So I will think them more after. <laughs> oh, thank you, Nam Kojan. I think we can proceed with the Q&A. So if there are any questions from the audience and if you would like to use your own voice, you can just raise your hand on the Zoom or you can type in your questions in the chat box so that I can read them out. Let me check. Oh, okay. We have already three. Okay, where shall I snow jump? Uh, I think we can set to start with you. Samra, uh, it's, uh... Fantastic to see these uh, faces. I mean, to see Namuk, to see uh, Sibel, uh, Sibyl, Semra, uh, Melike. So, hello to you all. Uh, first of all, uh, a great thank you uh, to Namuk for this uh, groundbreaking article. But I think an even greater thank you for all those individuals who promoted the article for uh, the award, because um, uh, as uh, Sibel said, uh, the JSAH is a flagship, you know, journal, but uh, uh, to uh, be published uh, there, uh, but to um, succeed in publishing there doesn't immediately bring this, you know, recognition. So I think um, this is an important step, not just the article, but the uh, granting of the award towards uh, the writing of a truly global architectural history. My question is uh, a rather personal one. I happen to know together with uh, Sevil, uh, I think, that uh, when uh, Namuk you know, presented this article, very much in the same format, with the same you know, evidence, with the same you know, uh, groundbreaking argument, it was rejected. And uh, it wasn't, uh, and the uh, response that came for the rejection was not even uh, sufficiently art articulated. I mean, it was just a plain rejection. I mean, normally if the journal sees a potential in the article, they will say, uh, yes, I mean, uh, if you make such and such an amendment, uh, then uh, the article will be reconsidered. There was not even such a thing. And yet, I mean, this was a very important article and I would like to uh, congratulate, you know, Namak for uh, sticking to his guns and resubmitting it. My uh, question to Namak at this point is, uh, what was exactly uh, that you added to uh, resubmit the article, which made it publishable for the JSAH? I mean, was it something very significant? Because I think uh, in the initial, you know, uh, submission, uh, the significance was very much the same. It was still groundbreaking, yeah. Yeah. and uh, I don't think there was a great, you know, difference. <laughs> so thank you for, uh, you know, uh, the, the sticking to the guns to publish it, <laughs> and for the award for uh, experts in the field to uh, elevate this, uh, you know, uh, granary, you know, architecture with this. Uh, I mean, you have a very unique approach 
you are actually uh, in an architectural historical way creating new evidence you are creating a new category of evidence which makes this whole thing you know very original but that didn't seem to be perceived in the original thing so the question yeah. is uh, what made the difference uh, in the second you know submission um <laughs> i have uh, <laughs> two uh, things thank you uh, suno hojam for uh, your uh, bringing out this incident so the one thing was uh, <laughs> the title was <laughs> Ottoman Istanbul mm -hmm. and I changed it into early modern Istanbul and uh, <laughs> I think this was one of the things that made it um, more um, conceived to a greater audience it was seen very very much specific and I had the research on the European granaries and also the granaries in the same period as well. So I included them more. So I bring out this, not something very specifically Ottoman because then it becomes, you know, it's a quotidian building. If it's architectural history, it's questionable. If it's a, you know, uh, you know, so, um, it's, it's a, uh, and there are too many things that makes it too much um, specific. And then I changed, I made it more, um, um, more um, related to other things happening in within the same period by adding uh, references, necessary references, and also some things mm -hmm. like that. And the very interesting thing, the, <laughs> the publication was uh, strange in the sense that they, it would be published at 2019. And then I was waiting in the summer, it didn't came out. And then I asked the editor, where is the article? And he said, ah, oh, we forget it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? It was all accepted. Everything was done. And I'm like, oh, we will publish it in the first uh, um, one in 2020. And that's how I am in the prize circle. You know, without the, if it was published in 2019, I wouldn't be able to apply <laughs> to uh, this award, which I'm very, very honored to receive. So uh, technically I wouldn't be able to. So it was sometimes these kinds of things works in a positive way, I should say. So again, I mean, uh, great congratulations, not only to you, but I think also to the committee, I mean, who saw yeah. the merit in this, you know, article. And I think that will be an encouragement to people, you know, working in the field. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Snowjan. I think Zozan is uh, the next, and then back you can ask. My apologies, I, it's been three years, I still forget to unmute myself. Um, uh, hi, uh, good morning or good afternoon from Minneapolis. It's very warm here too, we are burning. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arkal or Nabuk, if I may call, uh, it's, yeah. uh, it was a wonderful presentation. I haven't, I, I should admit that I haven't read the article, um, but uh, I have uh, just like while, the link was shared, I went over the bibliography uh, and noticed the amount of the work that has been done just like just provisioning of Istanbul uh, as, as the main capital of the empire. So my questions are two I have, and you might think that they are really irrelevant, but I just like for somebody who's working on environmental history of uh, Ottoman uh, empire in 19th century, I'm, I have been, specifically looking to the 19th century granaries uh, in the Kurdish provinces of the empire particularly. Uh, so my questions, the first question is uh, about the circulation of grain across the empire, whether you came across any mapping, because I spent a considerable amount of time to see a type of map uh, uh, that actually shows the grain circulation and grain trade uh, across the empire. And there is only one kind of semi-ish mapping by Sam White uh, for early modern, and that is all. And yeah. that just shows Istanbul uh, circulation. 
Uh, that was that's the first question. The second question is whether did you come across uh, while we were doing this research uh, about the dimension or kind of the quantity or the number of the granaries uh, within the uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, either early modern era or in in modern era. Uh, thank you again. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much for your. Uh, question and uh, also broad broadening it to the larger context of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, um, as I said, the, the field is emerging both in the Ottoman Empire and also in the other places. The economic historians write about this very much, but the actual buildings. Um, I know um, I don't, my network the, the network that uh, my granaries are connected are, are generally maritime networks, uh, with the exception of the very early edicts in relation to trade of grain uh, in the uh, time of Mehmet II. Uh, later on, it turns out to be all related, um, uh, uh, based uh, with uh, the um, navigation and maritime transportation. That's also, of course, a reason why the great arsenal was involved in that. So the capital city has, in fact, grain reserves at very close distance, but they keep it. Uh, 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 that's also another emergency supply. They keep the ones in, um, in uh, Tekirda and also around Bursa. So that's the last reserve, but uh, usually no need. But um, um, then, this, um, the grain is, of course, uh, the preservation of grain is very much uh, related to the local uh, conditions. And so they really change from place to place. I was, uh, for example, I looked to the granaries of Joseph uh, Ambar Yusuf in uh, Cairo, uh, uh, across the uh, uh, Rhode Island and near Babil, uh, the, uh, the Coptic, um, you know, settlement. So there, basically, it is walls and it's open air. So they put some hussar and some, some things over it, and that's the granary. Huge, huge, huge amount within the walls and so on. In Damascus, it's a street of granaries, all like shops, and you know, with wooden beams. And the French has worked on that specifically, but unfortunately. I don't have uh, knowledge on other local cases, uh, with the exception of you know uh, cave granaries and things like that. But I I think that there is some kind of a vernacular relation between these wooden bins, elevated bins on the grand scale, and the local type of granaries we see around, uh, specifically in Anatolia. Um, raised and on the ground and kept within um, um, as a, so there might be, but there might also be a relationship between the storages within the grain ships, which are also uh, made like uh, bins. So uh, to your answer, I don't have, know a lot of maps. Thank you for reminding Sam White's work. That was, was what I was trying to say. So the age of um, the climate of rebellion I don't see that architecturally in Istanbul, strangely. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I see the mid 16th century, for example, the famine in the beginning of Kurshun Masa. So I can relate that to uh, an event and period, but not in it. But that might also be changing as the moving of the capital to an extent to Edirne. And so maybe Istanbul consumed less, I don't know. But the but uh, in the regional sense, I have uh, very, uh, I don't have more information, but I would love to uh, exchange uh, uh, knowledge and uh, would like to read uh, your work after uh, uh, your work as well. Thank you. Oh, I think we almost reached the 90 minute mark, right? But please go for it. 
Uh, Namu Kojam, thank you so much for your for writing the article first, but and also uh, for the presentation. I had two questions, and um, they are sort of tangential. Uh, you may or not be uh, able to respond because I, I don't think they are things that you specifically studied. The the is there a connection? I'm wondering between the uh, price history of grains and building these things. I believe in general, Ottomans had a NARC system on the market set yeah. prices. Um, but as time, you know, as times changed, I wonder whether uh, the, the it got a little loser. The reason I'm asking this is when I think about building big uh, sort of depots, I think of long distance traders uh, in Northwestern Europe who uh, would like to have big depots because if uh, the all the things that came with the ship from India all of a sudden were sold into the market, the price would go down. So they want to control the price by releasing things a bit by a bit, et cetera. So there is an economic rationale. Is there any possibility of uh, making more investments into larger architectural spaces to store more grain, to keep the grain prices more in check if if the prices have been sort of going more market-wise in the 18, late 18, early 19 centuries, mm -hmm. about which I know nothing, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe there could have been a connection. So that's one question. And the other question is, the sort of his the after history the post history of these buildings if i remember if i understood it correctly the building that you showed us a picture of in Üsküdar is the current devlet tiyatrosu yeah. uh, so it's used as a uh, as a theater hall but, but it, it, the building's name is tekel uh, tekel sahnesi so it, it must have been the monopoly of alcohol and tobacco uh, that actually acquired the building. It seems like it was transferred from one type of thing to another type of state thing. Do you, what, what did they store in there? Was it alcohol? Was it tobacco? Do you have any idea about uh, what it was used for became, before it became a, a theater? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, um, and the, the economic histories that I, uh, Read also uh, relates the uh, grain inspectorate's trials uh, to uh, store more grain and to be active within the market as a way to control the prices and also take more taxes and uh, gain more um, money from the circulation of the uh, grain and. Uh, that's um, thank you for that, and it's pro it it is because also with the grain inspectorate there is a grain treasury that is founded, and they are, they are founded at the same time. So this grain treasury is one of the main supports of the government uh, about its uh, uh, projects uh, um, at that time, and um, so uh, I think the answer uh, is surely yes for the. Time, time of the inspector because um, the amount of the grain uh, doesn't seem to change radically uh, in storage when you look to the 18th century arsenal granaries and then compare it with the grain inspectorates newer ones but they were well better equipped uh, and they could control the circulation better and this double bins also uh, created a better uh, condition for that but uh, still there was um, there was corruption and it was uh, of course a kind of a affair that failed but um, yes they were uh, for sure related and that might at the same time uh, be another reason for this in palaces of grain in Europe as well it's not just about you know uh, the way about the um, how you know, all the um, things and their circulation around Paris is controlled, uh, you know, the Ferme General and that type of mentality leading to the revolution at the end. So the, 
the type of control on the flow of things uh, with the absolute state is also economic, you're right, and it's very important. But the point is that uh, regimes of, of, of food security uh, convince the people with the rhetoric of, um, you know, um, the possibility of famine. So they are, you know, doing um, at the same time. So that becomes the fear of, um, you know, paucity uh, is one of the reasons for at the background of these institutions to be accepted by the people. Of course, there are many different cases. In the case of uh, city states, it is probably a more a shared um, um, shared institution. It's not just from top, but it was also a kind of a more civic institute institution. It can change. Thank you very much for bringing out the uh, the histories of these uh, buildings. Uh, interestingly, in the case of uh, Istanbul, they are uh, almost till the end used as storage places, all of them, and um, which is different from the European uh, 18th century ones. They turn into palaces. They were palaces for gain, and then they became army barracks. They become actual palaces and uh, so, because they are built as such, and uh, for example, the papal granary in Rome, these all are transformed into uh, civic institutions or state institutions as palaces. But in the case of this uh, utilitarian buildings that we see in the Ottoman case, they are kept being storage places to the till the end. That's probably why I don't have a single inside photograph of this. You know, I'm. I'm trying to tell you all about these wooden bins, how they were made from trying to visualize them, but because I don't have a photograph of, because they changed later. Uh, first, there were steel floors built within the interiors, the wooden ones were taken out, and they were used uh, for different types of storage. The ones in the arsenal were used for salt storage, and uh, they were also used for army uh, storage for a period. For example, the one in Uskudar was still used for as the reserve for army during the First World uh, War. Uh, and uh, the Teke, but they were connected, of, uh, combined within the uh, late, uh, the early Republican period into mostly Teke. Um, under Tekel, and that included probably also tobacco, and uh, you know um, maybe also uh, maybe actual storage of the other things that Tekel uh, produce at the same time. Uh, but then the at the final stage before the theater, there were concrete floors within uh, the Akuzlimana uh, uh, granaries, and now they are used as a, as you said as uh, the theaters, uh, the, the state theater. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for your question, Jan. There are two buildings of Zirat Bankası, which are built exactly at the same spot with the Ambar, uh, the Arpa Emaniti storehouse and, uh, and the uh, Beat storehouse. That should not be a coincidence. So probably these storehouses were given to the uh, uh, the agriculture bank. Uh, so there's also a continuation to an extent there. Yes, I think we have another question, right? Oh, yeah. just, a, just a quick note. I just searched in Istanbul University library collection, the photograph collection, and I found actually the image that you showed us inside of the building from Abdul Hamid's collection. So uh, there are photos there uh, and it looks beautiful actually inside of the building, the ambars that you showed us. Now I have searched them also, but I don't know, um, maybe. Here, I will, I will... Thank you very much. Maybe you can, we can exchange the links over yeah. here. By the way, I should have also mentioned earlier that like I just uh, put the link to 
the article on the chat box, but if you have any difficulty to access it, you can reach out to me and I can send you the PDF file. So I'm checking if we have any more questions or comments. And if not, I think I'll just end uh, by just commenting very shortly. Uh, while I was reading your article, uh, Namukoja, with Yevuz's dissertation, of course, on my mind, I thought that his focus, the libraries, and your focus, the granaries, are ostensibly two very distinct typologies of uh, early modern Istanbul. They might not overlap, but I think complement each other, um, addressing to these spaces of accumulation, the repositories and treasury, quote unquote, which Yavuz and also you directly uh, refer and mentioned in your works. So like this was a kind of a different treasury, like food for thought, but also yours is like uh, directly and uh, literally the food feeding the city. So I'm again very pleased that you are, you have this, uh, you're awarded this prize. Thank you very much. This is, uh, I, I taught the same thing reading the dissertation of Yosef. Right. Thank yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I have some other parallels as well, as well. But yeah, these, like, particularly specifically these mentions, the word treasure, both yeah. he referred and you, I think, gives away a lot of these parallels, even though the typology seems very, very different. And also, one more thing, just very shortly, these, like, buildings, uh, that's supposed to be efficiently first and foremost, and also should be safe and sound against the disasters, the fire and also the earthquakes. These very delicate buildings uh, providing the sources for the city to run uh, is also again another parallels I think. Uh, so thank you very much for your very informative talk. If there isn't anything to add, I think we can end the session. Thanks again for everyone and see you maybe all or some of you <laughs> face to face. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you, you Namak Ojam, uh, for writing the article for presentation. Sibel, thank you so much for uh, your commentary. Semra, thank you so much for moderating it. And um, if you are interested next month uh, we'll talk about digital ottoman studies hopefully at our whatsapp meeting thank you thank you so much for making time thank you thank you